Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. A noted author and journalist, Louise Bernicow, has turned her passionate belief in the benefits of history, along with her commitment to feminism and fascination with politics, into the wonderful story of how New York women won the right to vote. So you say you're like Nancy Drew. I am. <laughs> it's a mystery. Yeah. Um, it's a mystery that I started investigating because just down the road from where we're sitting is the Gotham Institute for New York History, which is a wonderful organization. And the director, Suzanne Wasserman, asked me a year and a half ago if there was some topic in New York women's history that I could talk about because New York has always been a women's city and there are great New York stories. I said, sure. And I thought, well, I'll just look up the story of the suffrage movement in New York because I know from all my other work that you can study any place through the lens of the suffrage movement. You get to see local politics. It's not one story everywhere. It's different. All politics is local, as you've taught me. Um, <laughs> So every is that, who's, who, is that who Governor is that what Governor Perry is saying? I'm not sure, but one of them. Is, anyway, sorry. I don't know what he's I don't saying. Mean to interrupt. And for today, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I would just look at the New York story about the suffrage movement because I didn't know what it was. For all yeah. that I have studied, right. I thought I don't know how women in New York won the vote, when they won it. And I discovered, first of all, that there's almost nothing written about it. I'll tell you the truth. I thought, well, I'll read two or three sources. I can give a talk that yeah. lasts an hour, you know, easy. And so now it's a year and a half later, and I'm still uncovering things. Here's what I found as a broad outline. I found New York women won the right to vote in the state in 1917. That's three years before the federal amendment. But, it, but they weren't the first state. <coughs> it wasn't, New York was not the first state. No, no. <coughs> In fact, the big picture, if you want to go back, the generation of Stanton and Anthony and Matilda mm -hmm. Jocelyn Gage and all those 19th century women had the vote as part of the agenda right. for women's rights. And they didn't get very far. So when they had already passed on and the 20th century began, there were, I think, four states in which women had won the right to vote. So a new generation picked up the banner, um, organized quite a different women's movement. So we come to New York as part of this new gen. No, they're not the first, mm -hmm. but they're the biggest. In 1917, there was a state referendum, and New York women won the right to vote three years before the federal amendment was passed. Well, now, that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize right, to yeah, you. That Can we I? were ahead, fortunately. No, but also that I, I think, yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah. this was a tipping point uh, for the national, on the road to the national, national When amendment. you say they won the right to vote, what could they vote on in New York State? Could when they, they vote for president? Yes, they could. Oh, 1917 was a state referendum to mm -hmm. give women full suffrage. Right. Before that, there are other places and other stories in other towns where women could vote um, as far back as the 19th century in some local elections. But this is, this is the mm -hmm. whole kahuna. <laughs> but I'm going to, this is not really fair of me, but anyway, let me ask you this question. If they had the right to vote, and there were more women in New York than in the other states, I think, so it must have made a big impact on the size of the vote. That's, that's What happened the point. with the redistricting? Or is that based on the Senate? It's based on the, there's something on the ballot that is according to the vote. What's well, interesting, you, you'll you have to look in this. I'll put that on my list. All right, you go because to Because I'm still busy <laughs> unraveling yeah. the story of how this happened. Right, that, okay. That's really what I've been working Actually, on. Actually, the census is what determines uh, the redistricting, so Thank forget you. it. It's not the voters. <laughs> there, are so However, many, there are so many things but I don't But it does determine know. the place on a ballot. Yes, the size of the vote. Well, so you've got your finger. Democrats? You've got your finger on something important. Um, most of them were pretty evenly split. The Republican Party was quite a different thing mm -hmm. in 1917 mm -hmm. <laughs> than it is today. But the point is, because of the volume, because of the sheer number of women who could vote in New York State in 1917, follow this. It's math. Yeah. Higher math. Right. It doubled the number of women in the whole country who could vote. That's how many women were in New York. 
But the really intriguing part of the story is how did this happen? Yeah. That's what Nancy Drew has okay. been working on. Tell us, please. I will tell you briefly. It's a story that touches every aspect of New York history and American history, and that's why I can't detach from this mm. mad obsession I have <laughs> of saying, oh, well, if this happened, who did she know? There's mm -hmm. very little work on it, and so I've been yeah, following yeah. my nose. I want to say thank you to Google and to modern technology, because I don't think this work really could have been done without having access right. to newspaper archives um, online. Yeah. So here's the story. For, um, it's a new generation. It's literally the daughters of the founders, because one of the important people in this story is Harriet Stanton Blatch, who is the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She lives in New York. She has what we would call left-wing politics. She is interested in um, organizing and improving the lot of working women, which is mostly women in the garment trade, the millinery trade. Now, you know these women because these are the women who were involved in the Triangle Fire. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, this story touches every beat, really, of the history of New York. It's just the part that hasn't been mm -hmm. connected and told. So Harriet Stanton Blatch is organizing working women who are also organizing themselves. There were huge marches and demonstrations about the abuses of the garment district, as we know, both before and after the, the Triangle Fire. Fire. A lot of the women we call suffragists were also involved in the triangle agitations. Inez Milholland was one. If you've ever seen a picture of suffrage marches, there's a gorgeous woman on a white horse. It's oh. actually a picture taken in Washington. Uh -huh. But she's on a white horse. She's the most regal, uh, beautiful looking woman leading the suffrage march. Well, she was involved with the triangle workers. And Harriet Stanton Blatch, brought a lot of those women into what you'd have to say was a moribund <laughs> yeah, uh, fight for the vote. Yeah. So you've got that end of the story. Who was Mr. Blatch? Some guy. Just a guy. In okay. England. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really no, an important yeah, part okay. of this story, um, as opposed to Henry Stanton, the, yeah. the father who, who really was. Um, I think the most important thing for the narrative is that Mr. Blatch died and um, his wife had to um, give up a lot of her activist work to go take care of family um, matters, but that's later. Okay. So here we are in 1909, 1910, and we've got, on the one hand, a renewed interest in the vote by working women, partly because they now believe that winning the vote will help them in minimum wage, working conditions, all the concerns of the working women of New York, so the vote makes sense on that side. And on the other side, there is a whole group of millionaires in New York City. Um, Louisine Havemeyer, one of my favorites, whose art collection is at the Met, all those Degas and yeah, Mary Cassatt, right? who, who with her husband brought the Impressionists to America, she's one. Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, my favorite, <laughs> um, who is a Vanderbilt and a Belmont, Belmont by marriage, and someone named Rosalie Jones, after whom Jones Beach is named. There really was a Jones family. Those are only three. There are many more. Very rich women in New York who not only give money to the suffrage movement, that's critical. The 19th century movement really never raised a lot of money. Right. Um, well, we all know that's critical to any struggle. Yes, right? yes. Right? and that's, that's why the story of the millionaires needs to be told to every women's philanthropy <laughs> organization yes. in the city today to see how women help women with their money. Well, what motivated these women? Well, Mrs. Van they're, they're all different. Um, Mrs. Vanderbilt Belmont was, I think, a feisty, independent woman. Two, two of these millionaires became activists when their husbands died. Um, and that's actually an American story. You was know? she divorced from Vanderbilt? She divorced Vanderbilt and, and then had Belmont. And a lot of money. She got a lot of money and then Belmont died uh. um, of, um, after an appendectomy. But, um, 
What was I saying about that? The, widows, widows. Yeah. Widows, if you know about colonial America, the laws for widows were far more lenient than the wars, than the laws. War. <laughs> Laws for single women. Widows That's in colonial America could own property. That's it's the big thing. And this is almost the same tradition, yeah. that, that by becoming a widow, empowered. an American woman was yeah. empowered. But these two are very different. Mrs. Belmont, I have the feeling, you know, there are no letters, there are no journals, there are some biographies, and they pretty virtually ignore her role in the suffrage movement. They talk a lot about her role in society and the controversial mm -hmm. marriage she arranged for her daughter, Consuelo. But I think Mrs. Belmont was chomping at the bit mm. because she had already done many autonomous things. She had a big hand in building the mansion they had on Fifth Avenue, a big, big spread in um, Long Island, and then, of course, in um, Newport. Um, she was a doyenne of Newport Society, and she had worked with the famous architect um, to build the house. So she was a very ambitious and yeah. independent woman yeah. anyway. And then someone, someone named Ida Husted Harper, took her to England, and she sat there and watched the English suffragists, oh. Mrs. Pankhurst yeah. and her friends, who were unbelievably militant. They were in the street. They were chaining themselves to the walls they of Parliament. They were in prison. They were force-fed. They were force-fed. Well, Americans were eventually, yeah. too. They were forced, And Mrs. Belmont came home and basically said, That's what's wrong with the Americans? What a bunch so of namby-pamby. Yeah. So the English influence on these women is very strong. Um, Mrs. Belmont, when her husband died, became not only an activist in the suffrage movement, but she decided to form her own organization. So now we come into this business of how history sees people. I'm, the things I've read say that she was very autocratic. You know, it reminds me of calling Barbara Streisand mm -hmm. a, a yeah. bitch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. know. I don't yeah. know. But she organized, it was called the Political Equality Association. And she had the idea that this movement should not just be white women. And Mrs. Belmont met publicly in meetings. Now, just step back for a minute and think about the early 20th mm -hmm. century and the social constrictions mm -hmm. about these women. Mm -hmm. You know, are they allowed even to be seen by themselves in public? Mm -hmm. It's not very common. You know, she's breaking a yeah. lot of social taboos. Right. So that's Mrs. Belmont. She organized with black women yeah, in New really York City. Mrs. Havemeyer did something very different. She was urged to join the movement by Mary Cassatt. The painter. The painter, whose work she had been buying mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And it was offered, joining the suffrage movement was offered by Mary Cassatt as a, pen, as a cure because Mrs. Havemeyer was in a very deep, de serious deep depression after her husband died. And the family was worried about her. Her friends were worried about her. This is the part I really love. And Mary Cassatt wrote her a letter that I've seen that said, go in for the suffrage. It will help you. So good. It was like the, the support of other women and the consciousness raising and everything else. Well, yeah. It's so familiar so great. Yes. to the fact that activism is an antidote yeah. to depression. Yes, absolutely. You know, and it, so it became, each of these women not only did something remarkable, but they were changed by mm -hmm. what they did. Mrs. Havemeyer is a wonderful story because she um, was very reticent at the beginning about speaking in public. And she gave, she only wrote, she wrote two accounts of her participation in this movement. I wish there were more. Um, and in one, she describes how she began making speeches at an art, at Nodler's art gallery on Fifth mm -hmm. Avenue when she lent her impressionist her paintings. paintings as fundraisers for the cause. Yeah. And she began speaking there. And Harriet Stanton Blatch was her encourager. And she got more and more. I mean, we've seen that it, it echoes so much the things we've seen in our own time. So she got more confident. And so my favorite story is in 1915. So now she's mm -hmm. been gaining confidence for three or four years. There was a campaign throughout the state. And Mrs. Havemeyer invented um, the torch of, not the torch, she invented a ship of state 
which was an object, looked like the Mayflower, all lit up yeah. with votes for women written. Uh -huh. And she went on an automobile <laughs> tour. Cars are very important yeah. to this movement. Right. Um, cars represent automobiles, uh -huh. which are new for women to be driving, represent modernity yes. to some people. And mobility. And, and mobility. The ability to move. That's right. So how do they organize? Well, they ride around in car caravans, some of them. These are rich white women. And other people have objections on the grounds of the it's images, rich white women, right? But we'll stay with them for a minute. So Mrs. Havemeyer rides around with the ship of state in her arms in various towns in upstate New York, gathers a crowd, sits up on the back of her <laughs> convertible, gives speeches. And then she carries something called um, the Torch of Liberty. This is a 1915 campaign. She's going to pass the Torch of Liberty to the New Jersey suffragists. And how are they going to do this? in the middle of the Hudson River. Oh, I could go on. She's written the story. But the point is. So they were so theatrical in the ability to get everybody's attention. That's right. And that's how, yeah. one of the ways they're different yeah. from the 19th century. This yeah. is all about public opinion. Right. It's so interesting. Now, what did they do with, with black people? How did they How did they? Well, this is the together? hardest part of the story to find. Uh, um, generally, the going news mm -hmm. is that um, white women suffragists were right. all racist and they wouldn't let black women and the in the same movement. with the feminist right the women's movement then when you start to look at it first of all that idea is based on one story and it's the story of Ida B Wells a black mm -hmm. woman who organized the suffrage movement mm -hmm. in Chicago among black women that she was her delegation, her Chicago delegation, said they didn't want her to march with them in Washington. This is a big march mm -hmm. on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. They didn't want her to march. That's true. But the end of that story is that she did march. Yes, there were objections. Yes, she was asked to go to the back of the bus. Right, in the in back the of the line, yeah. But there were white women in the Chicago delegation who said, no way and who insisted that not only did Ida B. Wells march with that delegation, she and a white woman carried the banner there. Yes. So that's like many stories we hear where we know about the problem, right, but, but we, we don't, never hear the, we never hear the yeah, resolution. The so there's that general yeah. idea about New York. Yeah. But New York is a very particular place. Um, like Chicago, it has right. a very large population of black people. Right. And there were many people in the black community chief among them, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh -huh. um, because let's remember that in order to win the vote, what you have to do is convince men who can vote <laughs> to agree that women should vote. So in the black community, it's really important to see who the men are who were convinced that this was a step toward equality. It's the next step in their progression. Right. Right. Okay. That's great. So now, what have you done with all this information? <laughs> You started by writing a women's almanac. I did. I wrote a women's almanac yeah. a long time ago. What I've done with this information so far is do talks. Okay. Um, I mean, clearly there's a book coming down the road, um, but I don't have it all yeah. yet. You could say I'm researching because every thread of the story, W.E.B. Du Bois, John Dewey, Max Eastman, those are stories that lead to various political factions in New York City. Haven't uncovered all of those yet. Tammany Hall and what their yeah. role was. So I'm still on the. So exciting. I'm it's still on the Nancy Nancy Drew true. discovery. And did you discover something recently? <laughs> <laughs> I brought this to show you, um, as an example, of how there are. What what's the Naked City um, tag? There are nine million yeah, stories, stories in or the something Naked like that. City. Yeah, yeah. There are ninety nine million yeah. stories <laughs> in the this. suffrage movement. So. On the um, online archive uh -huh. of the New York Times, I found this 1914 story that says, Foes of Suffrage Behave. That's the headline. Uh -huh. um, and it tells how the year before, 1913, in this place, which is on the Lower East Side, it's Avenue A, um, the suffrage speakers on soapboxes were attacked by people throwing bags uh -huh. of water, water on them. 
Let me just underline that was, the that fact. That was a common thing. I mean, they'd go out on street corners, too. And they'd be attacked with, yeah. by all kinds of things. Right. You know, it's also like our movement, where people just don't understand the strength yeah. of the opposition yeah. and how violent it often yeah. became. So the year before, they had been violent. Now they're behaving. And um, the people who are speaking include, you know, <laughs> if we had years, we could do profiles. Someone named Gussie Sunshine, who owns a luncheonette on the Lower East Side. She's one of the speakers. And the other speaker is Mrs. Florence Howe, <laughs> who is, in fact, it doesn't say so, the daughter of Julia Ward Howe. Howe. And so that gives you an idea of how many characters there yeah. are in the it's story. So great. It is. It's a and great story. The connections yeah. between them. Because I I really believe this is worth telling because it's a story about alliances. Women across lines of race and class. Yeah. Can do it together. Can do it together. They're not best friends, they're not in love with each other, they don't agree on every single thing, but they have a common goal. They have the same objective, right? Yes. So let's look at today. What do we learn from it for today? We learn that everybody should learn this lesson yeah. today. I mean, that's really right. where my there were, there emphasis were, comes that from. That recent um, feature story on television about Gloria Steinem, and it showed that wonderful parade down Fifth Avenue. I think that was the last one, wasn't it, that women have had, ex other than, I guess you could talk the, about the abortion, the right to choose or something in the Washington. The March for Women's Lives was right. pretty big yeah. in Washington. Yeah. In Washington. But is that spirit still here? What no. is happening? No. Uh, right. But that's what the backlash does. Yeah. I'm not going to say that women have lost their awareness or passion or desire right. for... I don't want you to have to say that. ...for right. equality. I would never say that. No, yeah. I think what we have to look at is that every... You know, the, um, the cliché is one step forward, two steps back. But the truth is <laughs> one step forward provokes a reaction that pushes mm -hmm. the steppers <laughs> back. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen now many years of a backlash against women's progress. And one of the ways it works <laughs> is by separating women from each other, separating them along lines of race and class. And that's what we're suffering from, because that march was unopposed in a sense. The mm -hmm. beginning of second wave feminism came out of the civil rights movement where women really yeah, recognized that they were not considered the But equals, also right? common interests. Right. And I'm not saying that the mm -hmm. issues are the same for mm -hmm. black women or Chicano women. It's not that, mm -hmm. but a sense of common interest. And this has been assaulted as badly. Maybe nobody's throwing bags full of water at us, but it's much more subtle today. And I think that um, we need to remind women of what we have in common and what now, we Now, how do you do. reconcile? You said the women came from all over for the vote. But there had to be a reason they wanted the vote, was that they really wanted to make an impact on what was happening in the world, right? Well, there are lots of reasons. It's really interesting. Yeah. One is just the idea of democracy. Um, I want you to know that when the Statue of Liberty arrived in New York Harbor in the 1880s, there was a group of women out there in the harbor with both, with placards that said American women have no democracy. So for some women, That's interesting. it's that idea. For other women, it's we need the vote so we can do this or that. As I said, the working women had very specific labor movement goals about it. But for women like Mrs. Belmont, um, it was the idea of democracy that women were not second-class citizens. So it didn't have to be. So it was the vote. Yeah. So interesting. But the Equal Rights Amendment campaigns have not. Are there any states, do you know, that have the Equal Rights Amendment, their own? Um, I'm not sure, but Carolyn Maloney in New yeah. York has intro introduced it again this time. Um, and I hope that everybody who's thinking about the Equal Rights Amendment will learn some of this history because it's a perfect case study for what we need to do now, which is remind women that there is a second-class citizenship that still exists in the written laws in some states that the ERA would obliterate. And this is a wonderful... I want this <laughs> curriculum to be, I, it's not yeah. in the history books. Yeah. This is New York State. <laughs> it's interesting. So you now have, you've got several 
stories that you tell as lectures, right? Right. And you go to colleges and to women's organizations right, right. and wherever you can go to spread this word and information. And particularly so government um, organizations. <laughs> so you have to write a book. I will eventually write a book as soon as I catch my breath. But as I said earlier, I don't have the whole story yet. Yeah. And I have some people helping me. Um, we didn't get to talk much about what the black women did do, but that's the hidden secret part. Beyond W.E.B. Du Bois and his magazine, The Crisis, and the women of the NAACP, there is a movement of black women for suffrage, and it's very wrapped up in what you would call uplift of the race. <laughs> Um, yeah. Racism and sexism are absolutely always have been together. Together, right. and so they're not called woman suffrage organizations; they're called other things. And I've just begun to scratch that. Well, I can't wait to hear it and to find out more about it. And I hope I'm going to read the book very soon. I can't wait to know it all. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Thank Ronnie. you, Louise. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.